Hello everyone, this is Joe with the Rice Station Christian Church here in Irvine, Kentucky, and I'd like to welcome you out to our Wednesday evening Bible study. You know, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is called by many different names in the scriptures. He's called Rabbi, meaning teacher. He's called Master. He's called Lord. He's called our Savior. He's called Son of Man. He's called Son of God. He's called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's called Messiah. He's called King. He's called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. He's called the Alpha and the Omega, which means the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's called the Word, and he's also called I Am. I Am. In John chapter 8, Jesus is explaining to some of the Jews who he is, but they don't really understand. So look at what Jesus says to them in John chapter 8 and verse 58. John 8, 58 says, I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. So we have Jesus here using an Old Testament reference referring back to Abraham to point out Jesus' deity, proclaiming that he is a part of the Almighty God. And, and we understand that when we study the Bible, a lot of people call it the Trinity, which means that there's one true God made up of three parts. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three separate, but yet one. And Jesus is pointing out here that he is a part of the Almighty God. Now, in Exodus, Moses is out in the desert, in Exodus 3, that is. And go ahead and turn there with me in your Bibles. In Exodus 3, Moses is out in the desert, and he's tending his flocks, when suddenly God speaks to Moses. So look there in Exodus 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 14, kind of a long section of Scripture, but it's very important to understand what's going on. And it says, starting in verse 1, now Moses was tending the flocks of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flocks to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight while the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that Moses had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed, indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them cry out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the, land, from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into the good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now uh, the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Egyptians, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that, is, uh, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. That is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am is simply another name for the all-powerful, almighty God. 
So this evening, if the Lord allows, we're going to explore some of the I am statements of Jesus, and hopefully we can all learn some things from these that we can add to our own personal evangelism so that we can use these statements when we talk to other people about who Jesus is. So the title of our message this evening is The Great I Am. The Great I Am. Now, an interesting fact about the I am statements of Jesus is that they, all seven, are found in the Gospel of John. So let's jump right into our first one. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6 and verse 35. John 6 and verse 35, and we find this first I am statement. And it says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, to fully understand this statement, we have to look at it in its context. You see, before this passage, Jesus had fed this multitude of 5,000, not counting women and children. So it could have been like 12,000 or 13,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two fish, and they had 12 basketfuls of fragments left over. So he fed this huge multitude with five loaves of bread and two fish. So the next day, this crowd follows Jesus farther, and Jesus does to them what he usually does to people, and he preached to them. And what Jesus says to them reveals if they were following him because they love him, because he's the Lord, or if they were just following him for the free food. Jesus preached to the crowd saying, I am the bread of life. So let's look at that. Let's look at what he preached to them in John 6, 47 through 58. There the scriptures say, I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I, which I give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father, so that the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on the bread will live forever. Now, of course, we today as the church can read this, and we can see a direct reference that Jesus is making toward the Lord's Supper. Now, keep in mind, Jesus had not yet established the Lord's Supper in John chapter 6, but he's making a reference that we can look back and see today because we take up the bread, which is symbolic of the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for you and I. And we take up the juice, which is symbolic of his shed blood so that we could have remission of our sins. But what this is saying, what Jesus is saying to this crowd and to us today is that he's the bread of life that he can fill us, that he can sustain us, that he can satisfy our spiritual hunger. Just like, you know, physical bread today. Physical bread will fill our stomachs, it will sustain life, and will satisfy physical hunger. But in John 6, when Jesus basically just wipes off the table, when he wipes off the bread and the fish and offers them himself, well, in verse 66, it lets us know that many of them turned away and no longer followed Jesus. So it really you know, drew the line in the sand and divided who was there for Jesus and who was there for the free food. Now, as we present the gospel to people, we need to tell them that Jesus is the true bread of life, the only one who can bring spiritual satisfaction to anyone. 
And when you're a Christian, you can look at your life and how your life was before, and you can see that. You can see that Jesus has brought your soul satisfaction. We sometimes sing that song, It is well with my soul. Well, it's well with our soul because we have Jesus, the bread of life, constantly satisfying us and energizing us and seeing us through. Now, if you're listening to this study tonight and you're not a Christian, I want you to know that Jesus Christ can satisfy you. Jesus Christ can satisfy you. In the Sermon on the Mount at the beginning, in Matthew 5 and verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. If you want to be filled by the bread of life, then come to Jesus Christ and obey him on his terms, which are set forth in the Bible. So let's go on to our second I am statement of Jesus. Like I said, there are seven, and we'll probably just make it through about four uh, today. Our second I am statement is found in John 8. John 8 and verse 12. So turn there with me in your Bibles. John 8, 12 says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, this is very common for us to hear that Jesus is the light of the world. And truly, with all the sin that's running wild in this world, and all the crime everywhere, and all the drugs, and people hurting one another, and people hating one another, and all the illness that's going on with the coronavirus, and heart disease, and cancer, with terrorists invading different places, with all this wickedness going on in the world, it can become such a dark place. So this world definitely needs the light of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, when Jesus was walking the earth in the flesh, he did shine that light everywhere that he went. Through the words that he said, he did shine that light. Through the things that he did when he fed multitudes, when he healed people, when he helped people, when he preached to people, he was shining his light. But now, nowadays, in the Christian age, we Christians are his light. And we are to reflect the light of Christ into this world. Just kind of like if you take a mirror outside on a, a sunny day and you get that light on that mirror and you can reflect it other places. That's the way we are to do with the light of Christ. You see, Jesus said that he is the light of the world, but also turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5 and Look at what verses 14 through 16 says. Jesus speaking here says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We are to reflect his light. We reflect his light when we speak as a Christian should speak. When we are quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, then we are reflecting his light. Proverbs 15 and verses 1 through 2 says this, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. So when we speak correctly, these gentle words, these loving words, these Christian words to people, when we don't let corrupt communication come out of our mouths, foul words and things like that, when we speak good, godly Christian things that build people up and encourage people, then we are letting our light shine. Also, we reflect his light when we're doing the things that Jesus would do, such as, you know, going to church and telling people about Jesus and inviting people to worship and reaching out to the poor, the sick, the grieving, and the dying. When we do those things, we are letting our light of Christ shine. Remember, Jesus said, whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. And whatever you haven't done for the least of these, you haven't done for me. Also, we reflect his light when we go around our peers or our co-workers and our schoolmates and we still stand up for the truth. We still stand up against evil. We still stand up against Satan when we're around these people wearing that full armor of God. When we do that, we are reflecting his light. We are reflecting Christ to this world. 
and because us because when we wear that form of God, because of that, we are shining the light. I mean, Romans 13 calls the armor of God the armor of light. So Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And next, the next I am statement is found in John 10. John 10, as a matter of fact, the next two that we're going to look at is found in John 10. So turn over there with me, John 10, and we'll read verses 1 through 10. There Jesus says, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the shepherd or and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus said this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who enter come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Jesus said that he is the gate. He said, I am the gate. Jesus is the one and only gate or the one and only door which we can enter through and be saved. He's the only gate that we can enter through and be a part of God's flock. He's the only gate that we can enter through and make preparation for heaven. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 12, Simon Peter said it very well when he said, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And he's talking about only by Jesus. And that's in Acts 4 and verse 12. Now this text that we just read, that long section of scripture in John 10, 1 through 10, mentions people trying to enter God's saved fold another way. And we see people trying to do that in this world today. Some people follow false world belief systems, such as Islam or Buddhism or Wicca or some false uh, man-made version of Christianity. People who follow these ways will not enter God's fold, will not enter his kingdom of heaven through any false avenues, however they try to do it. You can only enter through Jesus. And Jesus talks about this further in Matthew 7. If you'd turn there with me, I'd appreciate it. Matthew 7. And we'll read verses 13 through 14. And there Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus is that narrow way that few go through. Specifically notice there in Matthew 7 that Jesus said, Few will make it to heaven, and many won't. Many will stay on that broad road that leads to destruction. This is, of course, something that we must tell lost people as we talk to them about Jesus, that he's the only gate, he's the only door that someone can enter through and be saved. You can't go any other way except Jesus' way, the way he set forth in the Bible. There's only one way, and that's Christ. Now, our next I am statement is found right back there in John 10, once again. John 10, and we'll read verses 11 through 14. And there it says, Jesus speaking, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. The, the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is the hired hand and cares nothing about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. You know, when we look back to the Old Testament, we see that God oftentimes used shepherds to help lead his people. 
like Moses before he went to lead the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage and through the wilderness, he was first the shepherd of his father-in-law Jethro's uh, flocks. David, before he became the king of Israel, he was first a shepherd boy who watched over the flocks of his father. He even says that he killed lions and bears to protect the sheep. And the first people to spread the message that Jesus Christ is born were shepherds. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as the good shepherd, as the chief shepherd. He says, I am the shepherd. And he is because he watches over us Christians as his flock. A shepherd of sheep and, you know, a physical shepherd, someone who did the work of a shepherd, they would have a rod. And they would use that rod to smite if a, a predator came to kind of snatch one of the sheep. They would smite the enemy. Now, Jesus is our good shepherd. He gives us everything that we need to defeat our enemy, Satan. He gives us the word that we can study and grow in knowledge of. He gives us prayer access to the Father through him. And he even shows us how to use these weapons when Jesus himself was tempted in Matthew chapter 4. You know, a shepherd of sheep also would have a staff with a big hook on the end, and that would be used if a sheep started going off of course. The shepherd could take that hook and hook it around the sheep's neck and pull that sheep back into line, basically correct the course of the sheep. And our good shepherd, Jesus, gives us correction when we need it. If we start to stray off course, if we start not to live the Christian life like we should, the Lord Jesus can discipline us. He can correct us. And the Hebrew writer talks about that in Hebrews chapter 12, if you wanted to look at that in your own personal Bible study. Also, we read about this in what I like to call God's lost and found department, Luke chapter 15. And in Luke 15, Jesus tells three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back parables about the lost being found. And there's this one parable about a sheep and the shepherd. And remember, the sheep leaves, and when he's gone, the shepherd realizes it. So the shepherd leaves the 99, and he goes after that lost sheep, and he picks up the lost sheep, and he puts it on his back, and he comes back rejoins the sheep to the flock and throws a celebration. Jesus is our shepherd does that. He provides us with conviction. He provides us with correction to help get us back on course with the rest of the flock. Also in that lost and found department, we read some more about our shepherd in the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son. Remember the son goes off and he, he basically says to the dad, dad, I can't wait for you to die. Give me my money and give it to me now. And he takes it and he goes off and he wastes his inheritance and in wild sinful living and even goes after he runs out and hires himself out to be a servant to a man who put him to feeding the pigs. And the Bible says that he longed to fill his stomach with the slop or the pods that the pigs ate out of. And the Bible says when he came to his senses, and oh boy, don't people in the world need to do that. Come to their senses. A lot of people in the world need to do that. But when he came to his senses, he returned to the Father. And how did the Father receive him? With open arms. And that's the way the Lord does us. If we stray off course and we realize it, and we're convicted and we come back to him, our shepherd will meet us with open arms. He'll forgive us and put us back into a right relationship with him. Now, after that, we see that the prodigal son's brother, um, he didn't really like that the, the brother got to come back. So he went out and stubbed up. But the father, being the shepherd of his children, he goes out and he corrects that oldest son and tells him, you should be happy that your brother is back. So Jesus is our shepherd. He takes care of us and he provides for us in so many ways that we couldn't possibly name them all in the short time we have here in our, in our study. So, of course, Jesus is the chief shepherd of his entire flock. But God has established his church today with elders, also called bishops and also called pastors, who carry out the earthly part of shepherding. Now, the Apostle Paul 
spoke to the elders at the church of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. So let's look at the advice that's given the elders at Ephesus, and it really speaks to all elders in the Lord's church today. Acts 20, verses 28 through 31, there the apostle Paul says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that I, after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise to distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I've never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. So that's part of the job of the shepherds, to watch out, to make sure that the truth is taught, to just keep their eye on the entire flock because there can be, there's so much evil in this world and so much false doctrine in this world, and we must watch out, church. Now, the Hebrew writer speaks to all of us as the church today and reminds us a truth that we need to remember about our eldership, and that's in Hebrews 13 and verse 17. There the scriptures say this, Obey your leaders. So th this could say, Obey your elders. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. So Jesus is our good shepherd. We are his sheep, so we are to listen to him. We are to obey his word. In John chapter 10, Jesus specifically speaks of his sheep knowing his voice, and listening to him. So I ask you, are you listening to the good shepherd? Are you listening to the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ? Are you having him direct your life? I'd like to speak for a moment to the lost souls and strayed souls that may be watching this, this message. Lost soul or strayed soul, I want to ask you, will you listen to the voice of the good shepherd today and come into his fold? Will you listen to him and come through that one gate, that one door, which is Jesus Christ, and be saved? And remember, Jesus Christ, he loves us all so much that he laid his life down on the cross of Calvary, taking on all the sin and shame for our sins, paying our sin debt, being the perfect sinless Savior. He died and he rose again, and only we Christians can say we serve the risen living Lord. Lost soul, straight soul, I want you to know the Lord wants you to come to him. If you're straight, he wants you to come back to him. And I want you to know, lost soul, how to be saved. How to be saved is to obey on God's terms, to obey him in accordance with his word. And to obey him, the Bible tells us that we must hear the word of God. We must believe the word of God. We must be repentant of our sins. We must confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We must be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we must live faithfully all the way to the end. If you need to make a decision, I want to encourage you to contact me. My, my number here at the office is 606-723-4791. I'd love to talk to you about your soul. Or, you know, if you are ready to obey, then, then you can come up here to the church. Everything's ready, and we can baptize you into Christ. But let's finish up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your beautiful word that reminds us that you sent your Son, a part of the great I Am, to this world, Lord. And he tells us who he is clearly through his word, and he, he lived it, Father, and I pray that we take Christ Jesus as our example and that we live his word. I pray that as we evangelize to people that we can tell them who Jesus is and we can remind them of these great I am statements, Father, that are so wonderful to, to use to tell people about Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father, for loving us so bountifully that you give us one blessing after another. Thank you, Father, for just being so wonderful to us. Thank you, Father, for your forgiveness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. I pray that you bless each one who, who uh, watches this broadcast, Father, and we pray all this in Christ Jesus' holy name, and amen.